we're going to um, look at this idea of unleashing your new life, okay? Unleashing your new life. If I was going to give it a title, that's what I'd say, Unleash Your New Life. And if you have your Bible with you, if you could go to 1 Corinthians, go to chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. That's where we're going to start. And the reason I want to start there is because, to me, uh, this passage, I think, is uh, it's really powerful. It's a really powerful passage because, strangely enough, it's really a statement of hope. It's a statement of hope. And this is what it says. Uh, chapter 6, verse 9, uh, starting at verse 9, Paul the Apostle says this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And here's the kicker. Verse 11, it says, And, su and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. By the Spirit of God. So listen, okay? This point is, you know, within, um, within man-made religion, within man-made philosophy, and just kind of within our own man-made, like, egocentric lives, you know, um, a lot of times, like, initially when we hear something like this, we react, like, antagonistically, you know, when somebody says, you got to change, because this is what Paul is talking about. And so we come at this, like, um, really, you want me to change? Like, you're saying that because of these, these things are my life, I need to change. And so we just kind of are like, who are you to judge me, you know? That's the antagonism. Like, who are you to judge me? And who are you to tell me what to do? Get off my back, okay? Um, but the point is, is uh, when we respond this way, this sort of response, which is just really intrinsic to who we are as people, it's a really tragic thing. Because when we do this, what we're really saying is that we're limiting ourselves to ourselves. That's what we're doing. We're limiting ourselves to ourselves. And the big thing is, is like a response like that to become antagonistic to the fact that we need to have a change in our life is that that sort of response really is not even open to the potential of what God can do in your life. Not even open to what the potential of God in your life can do. And so, you know, like the things that Paul talks about here, whether it's like sexual problems, adultery, these sorts of things, whether it's stealing, because like if we're honest, you know, stealing is not always just like a dude with a gun in the bank, okay? Like stealing, we see it every day, you know what I mean? It, we, if we're honest, we've probably done it in our lives, to where we've done something for our own personal gain, you know, like we take a car and we price it at more than we know that it should be priced at. We take junk and we sell it for more than we should sell it at, you know? Just ultimately for our own personal gain. Um, we're covetous. Like, if we're honest, we're covetous. But, you know, a lot of us struggle with wanting what somebody else has, you know? And so, like, I want what he has. I want what she has. <coughs> Instead of um, being content in my own life with just and having peace with what God has done in my life, I want what somebody else has. And, and because of that, like, a lot of us just really go through life with this discontent because of that. Um, Paul talks about here revilers and drunkards, you know, like partiers. And so I think a lot of people may just be like, well, that's not really like some grave sin, you know what I mean? But the point is, is like even in that, it's a waste of your time in your life, okay? That's what he's talking about. And so... Just kind of like starting out there, if we just would leave it this way, um, just kind of coming from, looking at what Paul is saying, coming from man's way of thinking is, it's really uh, bizarre 
that we as people within our own little realm try to justify and we think to ourselves, uh, I'm going to go to heaven basically because God's a nice guy. And we have like this false notion that I'm going to go to heaven basically because God's a nice guy and he won't judge me because I'm a nice guy, you know? And yeah, I do bad things. Maybe I do bad things in life, but I don't do them all the time. You know, we say that to ourselves. I'm not really that bad because we look at other people and we say, that guy's worse than me. You know what I mean? We do that all the time because um, there's always somebody worse. Just the truth, you know? And I know, like, in my own life, as I was just kind of thinking about this, especially, like, even now and in my non-believing life, you, I've just gone through life where you point out other people and you just think to yourself and you justify your mind, well, I'm not that bad. Like, that guy's worse off than me. And if we're going to be graded on a curve, then I'm okay. You know what I mean? We just try to justify it in our minds. But, I mean, the point I'm making is, is in making this point, is if we went to heaven and heaven was like this, this reflection where we drug these attitudes into it is like where we're graded on the curve and we justify. If we made it to heaven that way, it would just not be a very good place. You know what I mean? It would because... Uh, it would just be exactly like what it is right now. And that's not a good thing. And, you know, um, I just think, like, in line with that, is like, if we look at the human experience, like if we were to just dra drag this into heaven with us, if we look at the human experience, it's not getting any better with time. It is not getting any better with time. And so it's like, that's kind of one of the most laughable things, like when you read human philosophy, you read like human political theory is that you, sometimes you come across this delusion that everything is getting better, you know, like they, people justify, oh yeah, we're getting better. And that we're just like philosophically, they come to some sort of conclusion that we're just one step away from this great political shift and it'll just make the world nirvana or something like that. And just those sorts of ideas are just kind of, they're pretty crazy because you think, these people not read history, you know what I mean? Anyone that theorizes like that, like, do they not read history? Because, you know, just to think that uh, a certain philosophy or a certain political theory, that just humans are going to fix fallen nature, that's the point, that humans are going to fix fallen nature, is crazy, you know what I mean? Because, like, fallen nature has, throughout time, for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years, been producing the same stuff, brokenness. That's what it does. And the point is, is it's not getting better. It's not, this brokenness is not slowing down. It's continuing on. And so, you know, here we come up against what Paul is saying in this chapter. And, you know, the fact is, like, here what we have in God's Word is just, it's reality therapy. You know, a lot of people don't like it, but it's, legit it's reality therapy and it says that we should change it tells us that we should change and it says that there's something intuitive within us to where we know that maybe there's actually some other way of looking at all this stuff you know what i mean versus this political theory and philosophy there's some different way maybe stealing you know what i mean is just like stealing that's what it is and I should stop justifying the fact that I'm a crook or something like that. You know what I mean? It's like, instead, maybe I should, do I really believe that I can trust God, have the faith that if I were honest and full of integrity that he would bless me? Okay, so, anyways, um, I like the Bible because it says a lot of things that I, myself, probably would never say, you know, if I'm honest. I just probably would never say it. Um, but it's, rea it's reality therapy. You know I mean, it's, it's a great thing. And so it's great because when we look at what Paul's saying, you face your, it causes us to face ourselves in a mirror. That's what it does. And when we do that in light of God's um, word and his light upon our lives, it forces us in this position where we have to face the fact. We have to face the fact that we're sinners, and we have to face the fact that 
there are limits to like what we can do, that there is right and that there is wrong, and they're not gray areas. It's, there is right and there is wrong. And what be- what's just really beautiful about what Paul is saying here is that point that he made in verse 5, like, such were some of you. Okay, such were some of you. You were that, he lists all these things off, but you're not that now. You were that, but you're not that. And that point that he makes is like the pivot point of transformation in a life. That's the pivot point because it's a statement of hope. And so we don't have to go through life where we're, um, when we grasp this, where it's like, okay, well, I'm just going to justify my sin. You know what I mean? Just justify my sin, my sexual morality, my stealing from people, my treating people like garbage. I'm going to justify it because I'm stuck with it, I can't change, and I don't want to walk around with a lot of guilt. So I'll just justify it in my head. You know what I mean? Because I don't want to go crazy. But the fact is, like, quite honestly, like, you will go crazy. You know what I mean? You're going to go crazy because guilt is a real thing, and it is a tormenting thing. It, that's why people are medicine and all these different things because of just the effects and the impact of guilt in their lives. So we have to deal with this issue. Like, it has to go away somehow. And so what Paul's talking about is like, well, why don't we go about it doing it this way? Like, why don't you let your guilt be washed, like sanctified, let it be justified by the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God in your life? Why not face that and face what's wrong within you and then uh, let it be extracted from you? Let it be extracted from you. That it let it be removed from your life. Okay, he's totally talking about a totally different concept here. Extracted or removed from your life is a gift from God, not only just to forgive you, but to transform you. It's a gift of God to transform you, and that's why Paul says, "Such were some of you." Um, And so that's kind of like what I want to talk about, kind of with the rest of my time here, is like in is how do you get to this point in your life where you can look at your life and you can look at one another and you can say, such were some of you, but you're not that anymore. And no matter what culture says, you're not that anymore. There is legitimate reality in you. Um, Maybe you say, God can recreate. Like the same God that created, maybe he can create a second time in my own life. You know what I mean? Maybe there's power for that. Maybe when the Bible says that we can be born again and recreated and that we're a new creation, it's possible, you know? And so that's what I want to look, kind of look at here, a couple examples. The next uh, passage would be like 2 Corinthians. And this is a good illustration. It's chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5. And I'm going to just look at verses 16 through 17. Because, like, quite honestly, this is almost like another unbelievable passage because it's amazing, you know? And so here's what he says, uh, the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, he starts at verse 16. He says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, as a human being is what he's talking about. But we don't know him that way either anymore because uh, he's been resurrected when this was written okay is what Paul's saying therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation she is a new creation the old things have passed away behold all things have become new so uh, again this is like another just beautiful point that Paul is making because it's a theological fact okay is what Paul says here is um, this truth is like, you know what? I don't regard anyone in Christ according to the flesh anymore. Even though I knew you in the flesh, like he's talking about meaning just in this physical dimension, this sin nature, even though I knew you that way, I don't know you that anymore. I don't know you that way anymore. But like, he, this is a point that he's making, but for us, it's a kind of a hard thing for us to wrap our brains around, you know what I mean? Because um, we're not perfect. None of us are. 
if we're honest, I mean, even as Christians, we are not perfect. And so how do you reconcile that, you know? Like, what, what's Paul talking about here? Like, how can he say all things are new, but then you look in your life, and it doesn't look like everything and all things are new? There's this, still some things there, you know what I mean? Well, it's a good question to ask yourself, but you've got to look at what he's saying in the passage, okay? What he's saying in the passage is, though I did regard you before as someone who had no other potential, you had like no other potential in your fallen nature to change. I don't regard you that way anymore, is what he's saying. Because he says, you are literally a new creation of Christ. And now I see a new creation. I see who you are in Christ. And so, you know, this uh, reconciling with, like, how do we do this when we see brokenness in our life is like, well, it's a very infant thing for a lot of us. It's still a baby thing. It's still an immature thing, but it's growing. That's the point. And so, you know, that's who you really are. And so Paul's saying, that's what I'm going to be. That's what I'm going to nourish. That's what I'm going to seek to stimulate and seek grow within you because that's really who you are. Spiritually, that's who you are. But the point is, is like if we, all of us sitting here, if we can't see ourselves in the light of who we are in Christ, like who we will be in Christ, then, um, you know, it's no wonder for a lot of us that we're just like trapped in this um, self-imposed prison of kind of just mediocrity and failure, and then we just try to justify it. You know what I mean? It's like, there's no forward progress, like I'm trapped. I mean, the, if we're just really honest, for a lot of Christians, it's a sad thing, is like a lot of Christians, because they don't grasp who they are, are just some of the most like guilt-tripped people in the planet. You know what I mean? They just live in this guilt trip because, you know, the fact is, like, there's a lot of people that are not Christians that are fine, you know what I mean? Because they're not trying to be better. They've, like, accepted in their mind, they're cool with who, who they are, basically. They're at peace with who they are because just being tired of that drama of guilt and reality, they basically embrace the philosophy of life that just accepts and accommodates wherever they are, you know what I mean? So they just start justifying it. And so they don't struggle with the things that we struggle with. A lot as Christians, you know, but for us as believers, we're like stuck with this book, you know what I mean? And so we say to ourselves, is like, this is kind of lofty expectation, like, I'm supposed to be here, and I'm like down here, you know what I mean? And, and then you're just like, what's wrong with me, basically, you know? But there's a way out of that, you know what I mean? You, The first step is you have to look at yourself, who you are at the core. And so constitutionally, you have to understand you are a new life literally in Christ and if you understand this foundational truth then you put to life your old you put to death your old life it's progressively it's a progressive growing reality in your life and there's power to do it including the way that you look at life that's how you start to rise above this is because it's the reality so like um, you know if you don't do that you find yourself you're just trapped because you don't know who you are in Christ. And you're not able to just look in the mirror and say, you know, I don't know you anymore, but I know who you can be and who you are literally in Christ. <coughs> but if you don't know who you are, you're trapped and not able to do that. But I just was thinking, as I was thinking through this, like a quick illustration. Um, so I have a friend, like as a young person, um, their mom sent him off to like summer camp. Okay, so this is a good one. So they... They leave for camp, I mean, they like leave their mom, they leave their friends, and they head off to camp, okay? They like leave the town that they live in. And so, something happens though, like during camp, they had like literally encounter God, okay? They come to know God, and they're born of the Spirit. Like they receive Christ, and they become a new person in Christ. And so, just the way that the person tells the story is like, when they come back from camp, this just so underlines and illustrates it. They come back from camp, they're like a totally new person. You know what I mean? They left one way, they come back, they're a totally different person. And their mom's just like, wow, like it's an alien person. You know what I mean? It's not the same person that came back. And so 
the point is like for this person there's a tangible change you know it's like real something that people see and people cannot deny but why you know what i mean why why how can that happen because what happened was for this person there's like a transformative change in their life okay and the transformative change is like that beyond them beyond the person that headed to camp, they now quite literally, they're just like this new person because God's spirit now is intrinsic to who they are. And it's the spirit of God that's changing them. And so they're not the same person that left the camp. They came back just a totally new creation in Christ, okay? And so, you know, do you understand, this? like it's a short example, but it illustrates what Paul's saying in the passage. It's like, you are, just like this person, a new creation of Christ. Old has passed away. You're a totally new person. You went one way to camp, and you came back, and you're like an alien now because there's a new reality. And so even like Paul, he says uh, in Romans, you don't need to turn there, but Romans uh, chapter 7, he's talking about himself, and he talks about his own struggle with sin, and he says, uh, you know, it's no longer I, but it's sin in me, okay? But the I, like no longer I, well, who's he talking about? He's talking about the I as being this new creation of Christ. And he's saying, I used to be Saul, now I'm Paul. I used to be a Christian killer, now I like, produce Christians. I make them, you know what I mean? By the word of God. And But even Paul's saying here in Romans 7, I struggle with covetousness. You know, he's just being transparent and honest. But he also is saying, it's not a reality of who I am anymore. It's not me, it's sin in me. And then he goes on, and there's this reorientation. This, and this is what we have to grasp, is in chapter 8 of Romans, he says, therefore, though, there's no condemnation for me, because in Christ, in the Spirit, I'm, he understands who he is, that I'm free from the whole life. And I'm able to by the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, so I don't fulfill the lesson of my flesh. He understands who he is, the power that's in his life. He's saying, I'm not going to walk in this old dimension, but I'm going to walk in this new dimension of spiritual reality so that I'm free from the old man. He understands it. So for people like Paul who understand this concept, when they fail, Paul's talking about, look, I struggle with stuff. When they fail, when they sin, when they're uh, in the flesh, like as we call it, you know, when they're in the flesh. Um, somebody that understands who they are, this reality, they can say to themselves, like, wake up. You know what I mean, like, wake up, like, take the cold water, throw it on your face, wake up. Because, you know, I can get back on the right track, I'm going to get back on the right track, because it's beyond me. There's a spiritual reality beyond me that enables me and, and empowers me with the capacity to do it. And so that you can say, get on track. You know what I mean? Get in the spirit, like repent and move on. That's, that, that is how change happens, okay? And so you don't sit around when you get pulled out left field or something like that and mope and grow up and say, well, you know, woe is me. God doesn't love me anymore because I'm a jerk or whatever. You don't do that. If you understand this, what you do is you understand who you are, that you're a new creation, and that's what you feed. That's what you nurture. And you put it to death, the Bible says, you put it to death your whole life. You literally put it to death. You just say, drop dead, man. You know what I mean? Just drop dead, and you're not going to master me. I'm not going to be your slave, because I know who I am. I'm a new creation. And so... Um, is that happens, like, what happens? Because when this is happening, you're resisting Satan, okay? And when you resist him, what does the Bible say? It says, he flees from you. But, like, an alternative is, like, when you don't resist, and you don't put to death the diesel life, and you don't continue to put it to death, and just live in this new reality, then you've got major problems, you know? You really do have major problems, because, like is you become passive in the spiritual journey and just kind of zone out or whatever, it's you're in a really dangerous place at that point. It, this is like a forward progress thing. And so um, it's just important to know, like even when you find yourself out in that field, you don't ever concede. You never concede. 
even when you're beat down on the ground, you get back up. And that's, that's the mystery, is like, because you can get back up. Even when you're down, beat down to the ground, you can get back up because it's outside of yourself. Because God is the one that's with you. And so, like, when you are stepping out in faith based upon who you are in Christ, there's no problem. You can always get back up. And so, anyway, that, just that concept there is very strategic to a forward movement um, and just unleashing this new life in, in, in our lives. Uh, so a couple of other concepts is, so there's this, what I just talked about, kind of two natures, you know? There's an old one and the new one, but there's this other concept also closely tied to it is that there's two kingdoms, okay? Two kingdoms. So like in the world, there's a lot of different countries, but there's really just two kingdoms. So like I'm an American, you know, but I'm a, for me, I'm a citizen of heaven first, you know? And so I always keep that in mind. It's like I could go to a hundred different countries, you know what I mean? I, we know people, I'm sure, that have been to other countries, you've been to other countries, but it's like wherever you go, the kingdom of God, it goes with you, if you understand this truth. And so your king, your Lord, like he goes with you, and so his kingdom, his authority, his power is with you wherever you go. You're part of that kingdom. But like on the flip side, alternatively, is like a lot of people belong to the kingdom of darkness because there are only two, you know what I mean? And so if you belong to the kingdom of darkness, then who's your master? You know what I mean? Satan. That's the bottom line. It may not sound pretty, but it's the truth. And so I just want to give you a couple of examples of this concept um, because this too is very strategic. Um, and grasping this whole thing and defining yourself in context of who you belong to, okay? So Ephesians, uh, if you want to look there or write it down, Ephesians chapter 2, and it's verses 1 through 3, and Paul says this, um, starting at verse 1, He made us alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom also we all once conduct ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So here, what Paul is like talking about, the picture is like this course of life and this fallen condition that God has made us alive and released us from, okay? But I want you to kind of just picture the part where he says, that we walked according to the course of darkness. Because we've all done it. That's what he says there. And so, point being is like, whether you're super nice, and you think that you're just the most beautiful, wonderful, nicest person in the world, you can think all that stuff. It could be true, I guess, too, about you. Um, but apart from Christ, you're still, you can be all those things, you're still living under the greatest poison of all, okay? Ties into this whole kingdom concept. It's like, because apart from Christ, you have just a pride and an arrogance against God. That's right, because of who you are a child of. And that's the delusion, you know, is like you can play God. Um, and that, and that, that's much more wicked than just robbing a bank and stuff like that. That drives all that stuff, is because there's this arrogance to think this arrogance against the creator of reality that we think that we can just blow off, you know? And that, when we are like that, that's bad. Because the fact is, like, that's the part of the course of the world. You know, I, I get to teach in a jail once in a while, and it's like, that right there is the core, is that um, the course of this life is that I'm just doing it on my own terms. And it just drives everything, you know what I mean? Our relationships, they get broken, we damage ourselves, we hurt people, we commit crimes or whatever for these guys, you know. That is all coming from that I'm doing life on my own terms, apart from him. That's that's the poison, you know, that's the course that Paul's talking about. It's the rebellion of Satan, um, the rebellion of Adam and Eve, and that's the rebellion that we're born with, you know. And so that really underscores and articulates the difference between the two kingdoms. 
And that's why Paul, like in um, Acts 26, don't turn there, but, you know, he said he was called to bring people from darkness to light, from the kingdom of God, or from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God, okay? And so that, that was his job description. But for us as believers, that's our job description too, you know, is that this reality of kingdom, that we're not trying, we are not trying to get people to join our church, okay? That's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to get them to join our club or our Christian nuances or politics, you know, our versions of all that stuff. But instead, like, we as believers, we're taking the kingdom of God wherever we go. That's what we're doing. So we're, by the power of God, we bring light. We bring by his power, freedom from darkness in our own lives and in the lives of other people by his spirit. And then we bring a freedom from this course of rebellion against God. Okay, that's the ultimate thing is like setting people free from rebellion and, to, and setting them free to God. And so anyway, there's two natures, there's two kingdoms that humanity has to deal with. And then the last thing is um, there's two different results. Okay. There's two different results. So that would be um, Galatians chapter 5, if you want to write it down or look at it. And Paul kind of there in Galatians 5, he sets up these two things, like the works and the results of a life outside of Christ, and then the results of a life in Christ, okay? So outside of Christ, he starts at Galatians 5, 19, and he says, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery. Fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, that's just like drugs, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's the outworking of the flesh, you know, is everything from hatred, jealousy, contention, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, but like, you know, we may just try to deflect and, and focus on something like murder or something like that, or something that we haven't done, you know what I mean? And so, but the the fact is, like, just give me a break, you know what I mean? Like, have we not ever been selfish in our ambitions, you know what I mean, we're honest, have we not coveted, like, have we not been jealous, all those things we've been, but these things that Paul's talking about, they, they are what create, like, just this poison in culture and society. But he says, and then he moves on, there's this alternative, though, is what he says, moving on from uh, 22, the alternative is the spirit. And the spirit, Paul says, produces love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against what you don't even need law. I mean, we don't need a law against that stuff because we're driven by it. You know, I mean, we're driven by love, faith, fullness, kindness, peace, gentleness, self-control. Like, there's no law against that stuff. And the point is, is like, these two different results, you, you have to decide. You have to decide is where do you want to plant your roots? That's the bottom line. Like, too many Christians, though, um, are playing or trying to play like kind of both sides of the fence, but it, it doesn't work. It'll never work. Okay. You can't be in the flesh and in the spirit simultaneous. It's just, anyone trying to do this, like just playing both sides of the fence, um, they're some of the most unhappy people in the world, you know, because they have this new nature and they're just like playing games with it, you know. And that's why Jesus says, like, um, if you're lukewarm, he's just going to spit you out of his mouth, you know? Because you need to be either hot or cold. And, and he says you're not hot or cold. You know, the point being is, like, figure out which... But the point is, like, figure out which team you're on. You have to make this choice. Is um, either you're going to walk in the Spirit or you're going to walk in the flesh. You have to make this decision. And you've got to figure out and be true to who you really are, you know? And if you're going to be a true follower of Christ, be a true follower of Christ. Or Christ, or Christ. You know, stop playing on, on both sides of the fence. Um, 
I just think it's interesting, like in all these passages, Paul, he's not talking to non-Christians. He's talking to Christians. Like Christians who struggle with these things like jealousy and envy, contention. They struggle with sexual sin. That's what he's talking. And, and so that's who he's talking to. So what the point is, like, what do we do? You know? Well, the results, though, like what he's talking about here, they tell you where your roots are. The results tell you where your roots are. So what do we do? Like pull, pull your roots out of the whole life. That's what you do. And you like sprinkle weed killer on that side of the fence where the old life is, you know what I mean? And by God's spirit, you do that. And you put to death the flesh that is creating jealousy within you, these weird attitudes and all this strange stuff. That's what you do. And you feed the life of the spirit. That's what you do. Because, you know, these results are based on where your roots are. Because when you nurture the life of the spirit, you literally change. Um, I mean, because, like, you just think about, like, genetically as a believer, you know, guess what? You're, like, born again. That's the bottom line. You have a new life in Christ. And with that reality, you are not limited to the old life anymore. You're not limited to the old life anymore. And so Christ in you is the hope of glory, okay? And so... This this should be our self concept. As believers, this should be our self concept. So anyway, as we close, um, the point I just want to make in closing is like as you begin to understand this basic, you know, concept, this this constitutional reality of this transference of uh, identity by identifying with Christ. That as you identify with His kingdom, as you identify with the results of His kingdom, and you cooperate. Okay, with the transforming power of God's spirit within you. When you come to terms with that fundamental reality, then what you do is like what Paul says in Romans 12, where he says, renew your, you renew your mind, your life is transformed. Um, you know, it says by the renewing of your mind, as your mind is shaped and molded to a mindset uh, that believes God's word, to be true for your life because it is you know as your mind's shaped and molded to that you are tra you're transformed you're changed and your the self-concept of who you are it begins to align with the reality of who you are in christ and so as that happens you understand that you're a child of god and that you you can do all things through christ that you're never separated from the love of god that He's for you, and he won't be against you. And even when you're, you hit these difficult times where you get tripped out of your mind because we still have the old nature, even then, he will deliver you. And you know and you can say, you know, to yourself, based on this reality of who you are, it's like game's not over, you know. Even when you get pulled way out left field, you can just say, I'm not quitting because I'm going to continue as a believer, to speak truth in my life about what Christ has done for me, about who I am. Because my hope, it's not in me. And my hope isn't in a church. My hope isn't in anything less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. That is what you speak to your life. And the Bible says, you know, as a man thinks, that's what he is. Like that functionally that we are a result of our thinking, okay? And so we need to walk in this reality, reshape our minds so that our self-concept, it just properly reflects the reality of who we actually are by the Spirit of God. And this is just kind of the closing point that I want to make is that God's Spirit is at work. If you're a believer, He's at work in your life. And by his spirit, that's why we have hope. That's why we have uh, expectation for something great in our life because of the work of his spirit in our lives. But if you limit yourself to just yourself, that's just the greatest dishonor to God, you know? When you limit yourself to yourself because you're cutting him out of the picture. And 
you need to understand he has made you and he's made me each one of us to be dependent on him you know and it's like we need we all need air right you know but it's the same that we need god and so you have to make a decision do not cut him out of your life and don't suffocate yourself as a result of that you know but instead just breathe the breath of life of the spirit of god you know and be what you are you know you're a person of a man a woman in need of god and when you do that allow him by his power to just work out the story of your life just let him work it out in your life you know by his power so